Hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. It is my great pleasure to introduce Marion Engelman Lado. She is a uh, professor at the law school here and does a lot of work with so many of our FES students. And I first heard about her work through one of my MESC students who's joint with public health who just raved about the professor so much. And I heard, was like, you have to meet this professor. She does such amazing work on environmental justice. So I was so excited to finally meet her. And so Amity Doodle and I suggested that she be a speaker here at FES. And so we're very pleased to have her come join us. Um, she does a lot of work that many of you may know with the Environmental Justice Law Clinic, which takes a lot of the work that that we do on environmental science and environmental policy and puts it into real world practice, looking for real world solution to help communities that are affected by environmental justice. And I know that many of you and many people from FES are involved in the Environmental Justice Clinic, but in conversations with her, she's interested in having more of you join her for work on policy and science. And um, we can look forward to hearing more about the Environmental Justice Clinic today. She also has done a lot of work on civil rights enforcement, especially in the environmental context, looking at toxic waste, industrial agriculture, and environmental contamination with a special focus on vulnerable populations. Um, part of this is through her work as a senior staff attorney at Earth Justice. She also served for 10 years as general counsel at New York Lawyers for Public Interest, and she's worked for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. She previously taught at Columbia Law School, the School of Law at Seton Hall University, and the School of Public Affairs at Barack College. She holds degrees from Cornell and Princeton and got her JD at UC Berkeley. And the courses she teaches, in addition to veterans, the, sorry, in addition to environmental justice clinics, she also teaches the Veterans Legal Service Clinic. So you can see that she's very interest, interested in justice on many fronts. And so please join me in welcoming her to FES. Thanks. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yeah. And, and thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks to Michelle for that uh, lovely introduction and to Amity and Michelle for um, having this idea. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I also want to thank you for lending your wonderful students. I, I enjoy working with FES students. They've really added so much dimension to the clinic and I'll be talking a little bit about the work of the clinic and, and uh, how all that works. Um, so this is our third semester at the Environmental Justice Clinic, and um, my research really is an outgrowth of the practice. My research interrogates uh, why EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has failed to develop a forceful civil rights program. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the work of the clinic, so you all are familiar with it, and it also grounds the research questions. Um, and then talk about the problem of EPA and a little bit about definitions I'm using, and then talk a little bit about the research. So I hope I can do all that pretty quickly, and then we have some time for, for a question and answers. Um, EPA's failures since its founding um, in terms of civil rights compliance work are very well known and very well documented. So the question that is raised is why? Why has EPA done such a terrible job at civil rights compliance and enforcement? And for those of us who are concerned about environmental justice, is there any hope for change? <laughs> Um, and you know, I titled the talk, No More Excuses, because I believe that there are real challenges in civil rights enforcement in the way in which it's structured under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But I do think there are opportunities for reform and opportunities for change. And I think the needs of environmental justice communities call out for more attention. If you think about the world of employment discrimination and how it's changed since the 1960s, we all expect, it's not perfect by any stretch, but we all expect if you're discriminated against, there is somewhere to go. You file a complaint, you expect certain things to happen. It has changed the mentality of what is acceptable. Whereas in the context of environmental justice, I would imagine a lot of you are saying, what is she talking about, civil rights and environmental justice? How does that even make sense? What is, is there a structure that applies? What laws do we don't think about it? We're not conscious that there is a civil rights structure that should apply. 
And so I think we owe it to communities and if we care or are passionate about the issues, we need to think about how do we bring race back from the margins in terms of remedies. I mean, we know there's a lot of great work by, by some of you and by people like Paul Mohai and, and um, Steve Wing who passed away and, and others in epidemiology and in toxicology and all kinds of areas that are showing that in fact there is a relationship between uh, race and exposure, race and where toxic facilities are located. But for those of us who are in the remedy side, how do we bring race back into the visible light of policy and uh, addressing those problems? And so I hope, finally, if I don't depress you too much in terms of the problem, I hope to land on what are some uh, possibilities for reform, um, both short and long term. One caveat before I jump into it is that this research is very much a work in progress. Frankly, I'm spending a lot of time with the clinic, which is very fulfilling. Um, but we also have uh, Freedom of Information Act requests out as part of the research. For example, I'm really trying to dig into, okay, anecdotally, we know EPA has a terrible record. There are reports and all that, but how much worse is it than other agencies? And it turns out that though the Department of Justice under an executive order, 12250, is supposed to require record keeping and collect information from all the federal agencies that do civil rights enforcement, it doesn't have any uniformity in its, in its record keeping or requiring that data to come in. So we had to FOIA all the agencies. And then, of course, if there's no uniformity in the request, there's no uniformity in the record keeping. And so what we're getting is apples and oranges, both in terms of inputs and outputs. You know, things like um, how many complaints does each, each agency handle? Uh, what kinds of complaints are they? How long does it take for them to handle a complaint? How many guidance documents do they have? What are the qualitative uh, you know, uh, um, elements of these guidance documents? Do they matter? None of that is uniform. So, uh, doing the FOIAs, the FOIA requests, the Freedom of Information Act requests, and then um, evaluating them takes a while. Um, we launched the Environmental Justice Clinic last January, and um, I, you know, the, the first question is, what do we do in the clinic? And I should say that it's interdisciplinary. We have law students, FES students, School of Public Health students, and the exciting part about that is in civil rights, um, there's a legal piece, which is is whoever you believe is discriminating, or do they meet the legal standard? But there's also a scientific piece. If you need to show harm, how do you show harm? What is the evidence that there's something going on? And so we work with a lot of um, different fields in science and the social sciences. And so it seemed like this wonderful opportunity for interdisciplinary work. So we've brought together students from a number of different schools. I was at Earth Justice most recently for the last seven years. I, I have a civil rights background. I should tell you if you ask me any tricky environmental law questions, you probably know them better than I do. Um, but if you ask me civil rights questions, I'll, I, I'm with you there. So, um, but the last seven years I spent at Earth Justice and I worked on a range of issues affecting low income communities and communities of color and vulnerable populations, toxics, waste, pesticides, et cetera. But over the last year and a half of the Obama administration, I really tried to clear my docket and just focus on civil rights enforcement to see if we could get reform in civil rights enforcement over the finish line. And I had seven administrative cases. These are cases brought on behalf of communities where decisions had been made or there were policies and practices that were disproportionately affecting them. And um, we also had some litigation against the Environmental Protection Agency. When a community files a complaint alleging discrimination against a recipient of EPA funding, EPA is supposed to acknowledge that complaint within five days, decide whether it's taking that complaint for investigation within 20 days, and then complete the investigation within 180 days. And we had litigation on behalf of five communities, including the oldest complaint in the country, filed in 1992, in Flint, Michigan, of all places, that was still outstanding in 2015. And what we did is sue EPA for its unreasonable delay in processing these complaints. So I had these administrative cases filed with EPA and litigation and brought them to the clinic so we could work together at both pro, you know, uh, taking legal action but also developing the scientific evidence in support 
of these claims. One of these cases is in Tallahassee, Alabama. Um, this is a landfill, the Stone's Throw landfill that is in the middle of the community. And it's a starting point for the discussion. Um, before getting into what's happening in Tallahassee, though, I just want to say a word about definitions. You all have probably seen the EPA definition of environmental justice. And the, the piece I want to draw out here is as I use the term and as EPA uses the term, um, there's a lot you could criticize in this term, but I'm, I'm not going to get into all the specifics of, of areas of controversy. If we have time, we could talk about that. But there is a procedural justice piece. That is, communities have felt, uh, whether they're low-income communities or communities of color, have felt that, um, that processes, that they've been left out in decision, from decision-making affecting their own lives. And so environmental justice calls for meaningful participation in decisions affecting their lives. There is also a distributive justice piece. Where are the environmental burdens and benefits located? And historically and today, it's easy to see why that there is structural racism in the country and the ways in which that has been baked into zoning decisions, where are industrial uh, uh, sources located, where are they not located, that there are from historically, uh, historically driven decisions and currently driven decisions, there are patterns of discrimination in the distribution of um, environmental benefits and burdens. Where are parks located? Who has access to parks? Where are industrial sites located? And who, are, who is disproportionately affected by those industrial sites? So there's the procedural aspect, there's the distributional aspect, and the substantive aspect that, that we want to focus on. Just a couple more minutes on this. One of the, the uh, controversies about the EPA um, definition is that it's sort of race neutral. If you go back, it doesn't really say anything about our history. It, it, it is um, you know, all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, it's race neutral. It doesn't have a historic specificity. Um, and if, if I think about the people in the environmental justice movement, how they uh, internally define environmental justice, it is not race neutral. It is historical and contextual. And so uh, there is a, a grounding in the fact that environmental hazards have been inequitably distributed in the United States and that communities have not been created equal in the United States and that in, indeed instead some communities are routinely poisoned while the government looks the other way. There is a sense of injustice and inequality and as uh, we talk about in the clinic, um, race and, and class are very much part of the injust environmental justice movement and, and we have to be upfront about that, we have to talk about that, we have to have a vocabulary for talking about that and it, it, it isn't hidden. So in this lecture and in class um, and in my research, we talk about race, and, and it, can't be, it can't be hidden. Um, so there's an inequality in the distribution of benefits and burdens, and there's, as you all know, this long history of research on that very, uh, that very issue. The United Church of Christ study back in 1987 was seen as the leader. Check, it itself check, was contested, check, check, but the, check, the, the, yeah, the major yeah, finding yeah, that came yeah, out of check, it was I'm that saying. race uh, was the most salient um, predictor of where hazardous sites were located. There were lots of kind of methodological questions that were uh, raised about this study, but it was the precursor to a very large body of literature, as you all know, uh, about the significance of race as a variable for predicting where toxic sites are located and, um, and the relationship between race and socioeco other socioeconomic variables and uh, the possibility of exposure. Now there's this significant literature which shows that race is an important predictor of air pollution levels, landfills. I think about Paul Mohai, Robin Saha, Rachel Morello Fresh, and Steve Wing. And I'll, I'll pause at Steve Wing. I, I have had the great opportunity to work with him before he passed away. And he and Jill Johnston did this study which we've used in one of the cases that, um, that our clinic has this is a case against the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality for permitting swine facilities in eastern North Carolina um, and, and really using the same permit conditions over and over and over despite knowing that they were inadequate, despite notice that they were disproportionately affecting communities of color. Um, the dots in this picture are each 
hog facilities. There are about 21, 2200 hog facilities in North Carolina. They're all clustered, as you see, in eastern North Carolina. You probably can't see Duplin County, but trust me, under those black dots is Duplin County, and it is uh, disproportionately people of color. The red areas are, um, are high percentage people of color. Um, and North Carolina and this you know, old plantation area of North Carolina um, is the most densely uh, populated with pigs in the world. There's something like in Duplin County, 40 pigs per person. And also, I don't have it on this slide, but there's some great slides um, that Environmental Working Group and Waterkeeper have put together that also show poultry. And if you overlay poultry, which has grown in the area, it is in the Central Plains and the Eastern Coastal area. And then you know something about a coastal area, which again, most of you probably know far more than I do, but I know it's a sandy, low-lying coastal area that doesn't take up a lot of the nutrients. And so unlike Iowa, which has more pigs on the whole than North Carolina, um, but it is not, it, it, they're spread out across the whole state. It's not a low-lying coastal area and its soil takes up the nutrients. Eastern North Carolina is absolutely inundated. The air is inundated, the, the way of life is affected. And so every five years, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality has uh, reissued pretty much the same complaint. And um, Steve Wing spent the last 10, 20 years of his life documenting both the relationship between where pigs are located and race and other variables um, and the long-term effects of living in, and going to school in proximity to all these pigs. And just, uh, I won't say too much because uh, Katie is eating, but um, if you know anything about swine, swine on average um, make about three times the, uh, the waste that humans do in North Carolina. Uh, waste management is such that the swine are all inside. A typical facility will have like 25 or 5,000 pigs. All of the pig waste is, goes through the floor and then is it collected in large cesspools that are open air. And then uh, the liquid from the cesspools is sprayed out on fields. And uh, the mist from the spray goes everywhere in the community. So can you imagine some of our clients are within two miles, one mile of five, 10 facilities, which means two miles, one mile of five open cesspools of the equivalent of towns of 15,000 people. And all that mist blowing into their cars, into their porches, when they try to go to their cars to go to the grocery store, people don't recreate outside. I mean, the impact on the way of life is tremendous. So um, the work of someone like Steve Wing and some of you is crucial because we could not, we would not have the basis for this kind of challenge and to take what the community is experiencing and put it together in a credible way to say this is unacceptable and it has this, it is um, disproportionately affecting people of color. Environmental justice is also about power and inclusion. I, I was talking before about the distributional aspects. I just want to say a word about power and inclusion. Um, environmental justice demands the right to participate as equal partners. And um, it's very much about self-determination and voice. Um, so it's not only about the outcome of decisions, but the way in which we do things, the way in which policy is made. Um, we saw this in Flint, that people were coming to their elected representatives, or sometimes not elected representatives, literally with bottles of water saying, believe us, something is going on here, our water is dirty, and they were ignored. And the commissions that came out, there was a Civil Rights Commission, there was a, a, the Flint Water Advisory Task Force report, acknowledged the intransigent disregard of compelling evidence from the population. They were literally ignored. The thing that's, that's so troubling about Flint beyond the, the confines of that location is how common that is. If you go back to Bob Bullard's Dumping in Dixie, maybe the seminal book on environmental justice, he talks about a community in Texas that was living near a lead smelter. And they had been arguing, this is affecting us. This is affecting our children. This is affecting our way of life. This lead smelter is poisoning us for decades. And nobody was listening to them. So Flint is not the anomaly. Flint is Eastern North Carolina. Flint is Texas. Flint is 
um, is so many places that we work with and, and represent across the country. And it is this sense that nobody is listening to us. And nobody is listening to us because we're black, we're disempowered, we're low income. And as much as we go in North Carolina, they have protested, they have organized, they have done everything that a community can do, and they're still ignored. So back to Tallahassee as a, another of the cases. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of a community that has done exactly what, uh, what I was mentioning. I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. This is Stone's Throw Landfill. It first opened as a dump in the 1980s. It was closed in the 90s. Uh, there was some water testing that was done, not comprehensive. Uh, the water testing showed toluene uh, in the drinking water. Uh, the, the community, I should say, that's around this landfill is 98% African American. It's a very historic community. Check, it was two, settled check, by African Americans two, uh, after the Civil War. Check, they were check, newly one, freed. Two. And they have passed this land on from generation to generation. And so this area is all African American. And as you, as you move away from this landfill, it's whiter and whiter. So if you're check, a half one, a mile two, away, check, it's 90% percent African American. Four, check, check, one, two, one, two, one. Okay. Am I too loud, not loud enough? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Um, well, you get the point. As you move away, it's whiter. That's the point. Um, beyond the statistics, though, this area has a way of life. Children, cousins, families have passed this land down. So the whole thing, I mean, I, I went to visit Ronald Smith and met next door his mother, Rose Smith. And down the street, Willie Smith. And the kids all played together and they all biked together. And their way of life was around being outside and having barbecues and, and living there. Now they can't do that. It smells, there's a methane flare, they're worried about their water, they kept cattle, their cattle die, they have no way of showing. I went door to door and talked to people about their experience. People feel there's a cancer cluster. The N, if you will, is too low. It would be pretty much impossible to show that there's a cancer cluster there. It's a small community. But they told me about whole families that were prematurely wiped out by cancer. Uh, they raised, so they, they have concerns about water pollution, air, odors, property use, property value, safety. This was an old community with kind of these roads are like this. These 18 wheelers go over and over and over down the street. And they're worried about their kids playing outside because they could be crushed by the 18 wheelers. You know, very common types of problems that could be solved if someone would pay attention. Vermin, buzzards, health issues. And so all this is happening at the same time. Um, for anyone who, uh, who wants to visualize the issue of race here. The orange on this map is the landfill. The orange stripes are land that the landfill was gobbling up because as people die, they don't want their kids to have the land. This is part of the tragedy, that they don't feel it's safe. And so the only folks who, the landfill actually affirmatively goes to people and say, when you die, can we buy your land? So they were gobbling up that part. The pink is all African-American owned land. The blue is white owned land. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but this is part of a larger problem of black land loss. And I just want to read very br briefly something that one of our clients, actually the woman who, who filed the civil rights complaint challenging the Alabama Department of Environmental Management's um, re-permitting of this facility in 2003. She said, our family property means everything to us. My great grandparents were slaves who came to the community in the 1800s as documented by the 1880 census. The land in this community is one of the only tangible, valuable things that my great-grandparents as former slaves were able to pass on to their descendants. My parents lived through Jim Crow segregation in Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy. Their land is all that they had and all that they had to pass on to me and my siblings in terms of wealth. To take this land away from their descendants, like me and my brother, who live and maintain ownership of the land by the landfill essentially making our family land unbearable to live on means that you extinguish everything we have to connect us to our heritage. This is um, Rose Smith and, um, and her son, Ron Smith. Our, they organized the Ashurst Bar Smith community organization that we represent. Um, they had given up. They had filed, they'd done all this work, they tried to collect information, they had filed a complaint in 2003 with the US EPA and that complaint was accepted in 2005 for investigation and it languished. 
It just sat there at EPA, and they didn't do anything. Um, and as I said before, EPA theoretically has 180 days to issue findings, and so we started talking to the Smiths in uh, 2015 and said, we're thinking of doing the suit on behalf of uh, a range of other groups. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure you knew about it, and they jumped in, and we represent them as well. What they have said is our case and civil rights enforcement is absolutely central to them. Um, they had given up, and through feeling like there were some options, that they had a right to something, that there was a way of talking about the role of race, it galvanized them. At the last permit renewal, they had hundreds of people going to that um, that hearing with the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, and they're thinking about all kinds of ways to get involved. In fact, with Rob Dubrow's uh, practicum in the School of Public Health, the clinic and uh, the practicum are doing an air monitoring study with our, our clients in Tallahassee to try to gather evidence of, um, of what they're experiencing. I just want to say, um, you know, Tallahassee is a good example that some of these cases, like where, you know, there is the case in court um, on behalf of Tallahassee and other folks that where we are trying to get a judge to say something to EPA, so I'm not trying to downplay the role of courts, but legal action is not only about courts. And in our clinic, we really think about the larger strategy and having it be uh, a strategy of the, of, that is cognizant of power dynamics and what can we do as lawyers and as scientists to partner with communities, to represent communities, get information in the hands of communities, and work with the strategies they're creating with our advice to elevate the truth that people are experiencing, to get information into their hands so that they can develop strategies and have a role in decision making. This includes developing, creating political space, helping to articulate a narrative, building a record, and supporting the community-based movement. So it's not only about uh, convincing a uh, court. This is another pig case that I was involved in, so I, I'm fascinated by swine. That's a whole other conversation. Um, this is a notice that um, that uh, Ron Smith created uh, for one of the community meetings um, that we participated in. And again, it just reflects the fact that there was kind of that the, the legal action helped to leverage more community activism rather than deflate it. There are a lot of legal strategies. I'm not going to talk about any of them. I'm really going to focus in and get to my research for a few minutes. Um, focusing in on civil rights law. Why civil rights law? What, what is the point here? Um, the clinic work focuses on civil rights, not exclusively, but we believe it is a way to highlight the experience people are having and make sure that race is uh, made more visible. Here's the statutory language. Um, we're focusing primarily on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits programs or activities that receive federal funds from discriminating. And each, uh, it not only, oh, where, where'd it go? There we go. There's the statute. Um, and not only discriminating, but being excluded from participation in, being denied the benefits of um, a, a program or activity that receives federal funds. And then Title VI also says every, and here's maybe the source of the problem, every federal agency that disperses federal funds, you hold the recipients of federal funds accountable. So structurally what that did for those policy mavens in here, instead of the EEOC, which is one central agency with the expertise on employment discrimination. It diffused or dispersed that expertise to small little offices of civil rights in lots of different agencies that have a dominant mode, a dominant sense of mission. And so the officer of civil rights may be competing with that dominant goal or that dominant sense of mission. And that indeed is a big part of why we have a failure at, um, the EPA. Every agency had the power to promulgate regulations, and they all did. Every agency promulgated regulations that made clear that discrimination was defined not just in terms of intentional discrimination, but actions that had an unjustified disparate impact. So if you receive federal funds from the Department of Interior, you have, can't d discriminate, and that is actions that are unjustified with a disparate impact, or it's actions that are intentionally discriminatory. Same thing at EPA, same thing at energy, et cetera. Potential violations then include intentional discrimination, 
actions with an unjustified disparate impact, exclusion from political processes, failure to evaluate disparate impact, and failure to provide language services. And not to get too legal, as a result of a 2001 Supreme Court case, we can only go to court to enforce Title VI if you can show intentional discrimination. I said you can't go to court to take act to challenge actions with a disparate impact, which are defined in the regulations. But they, they, they said the regulations may be valid, we're not ruling on that, but you have to go to the federal agency that gives out the federal money to hold the recipients of federal funds accountable. The only case you can go to court on is um, a claim of intentional discrimination. So we're stuck with each agency. So if there's a permit that has a disproportionate impact on the basis of race, like in Tallahassee, like in North Carolina, you have to say to EPA, hey, the Department of Environmental Quality, or the ADEM, the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, is, is approving a permit or taking an action or has a policy that discriminates by having an unjustified disproportionate impact on the basis of race. So you have to file an administrative complaint. And we're dependent on the federal agency to actually prosecute that administrative complaint. So here is where the problem is. Oh, sorry about that. EPA has an abominable record, an abominable record. Don't have to trust me. First of all, trust your own instincts. Have you ever heard of civil rights enforcement in this space? That tells you something. Probably not. Also, EPA, the office, so each, the civil rights enforcement is organized, as I said, by an office for civil rights. Right now at EPA, it's called the External Civil Rights Compliance Office, or ECRCO. But they're usually called offices for civil rights, so that's what I'll call them. Each agency has an office for civil rights. And um, EPA, when Lisa Jackson came in under President Obama, uh, Lisa Jackson can ask Deloitte to conduct an audit. What's going on here? Don't look at our substantive standards, but tell us, why aren't we more functional? Or am I right that we're not functional? And Deloitte uh, came out with its audit and said EPA has a poor record of civil rights enforcement. That was not a surprise to anyone who was looking at this, but it confirmed for Lisa Jackson that she should take action. They blamed case, the case management system, the staff, nobody had expertise, nobody had passion, they weren't mission driven, they needed training, they had turnover, it was all these sort of infrastructure problems. The Center for Public Integrity did this report um, called Decades of Inaction, which you can look at online. They, they FOIA'd all the old complaints to say, what does EPA do with these complaints? And they found they sit on them. They either, they either decide not to uh, pursue them or they sit on them. Um, the agency has what's called affirmative compliance responsibility. They're supposed to be holding accountable those, uh, those recipients of federal funds, either before they get money to say, we're gonna give you money, do you comply with Title VI? Let's do a compliance review, let's get information. Or once they get money, do we have reason to believe, like after Flint, you'd think that they would do a compliance review of the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Do you have appropriate policies? Are you inclusive enough? Should we continue to give you money and support this lack of compliance? They didn't, they never have exercised their affirmative compliance um, authority. So there are critiques after critiques, delays in handling complaints, lack of, um, of uh, using affirmative compliance authority, ineffective staffing, capacity, training issues, no clear legal guidance, no findings of discrimination. During the Obama administration, they were the first two findings of discrimination in the history of the environmental protection. This is the low part, I trust it. It's gonna get a little bit more hopeful. But it's, it's really bad, this is the, you know, a really, a uh, terrible agency in terms of um, fulfilling the mission that it is uh, statutorily um, authorized and required to fulfill. Um, in 2015, even after these reports came out, it came out, Bloomberg News did a, a report that found that, actually I think it came out when I was here in 2017, but um, it came out that in 2015, for a year, for 11 months, someone can correct me, um, EPA had failed to check its online inbox they had hundreds of emails of people who were complaining or asking for assistance. They failed to come check their inbox. How simple is that? So this is a dysfunctional agency. And if you just compare EPA's actions versus, uh, say, the Department of Education. Now, this is a little bit unfair because Department of Education is one of the most functional civil rights enforcement agencies. But in you know, the period 96 to 2013, 
EPA handled approximately 300 complaints. That includes, by the way, ADA complaints, disability complaints, not just race, but most of them. The vast, I think there are seven or eight ADA complaints. The vast majority are race discrimination complaints. Um, 60, they, of those, they accepted 64 for investigation. Uh, ultimately, by the end of the Obama administration, they had issued two preliminary findings. Those are the only two in the history of the agency. And they sort of did one compliance review. It was a complaint that came in, and they said, ah, we're going to dismiss the complaint, but we're going to check out whether the state is compliant. By contrast, uh, in one year, the Department of Education got 4,600 complaints. And they did 32 compliance, or just as a starting point, okay, vastly out of sync with what the responsibilities are at EPA. So why do we care then? Is this a hollow hope? That comes from a book by Gerald Rosenberg who, who said, civil rights is a hollow hope. It's, it gets us thinking that we can do something. And, and in fact, life goes on, and, and it's not about the law. Um, I clearly don't believe that. I, I think, actually, education, the, what happened at the EEOC, what happened at the Department of Education shows you that we can make change through civil rights. And it isn't everything, uh, it isn't the be all and end all, but it's a tool, it is a set of leverage points, and they should be effective. And we should expect that in the, if, we, if we want to do something about environmental justice. Again, it's not the only tool we have, but it is a tool that's so important for rendering visible the issue of race. Um, it brings that issue out of uh, the shadows, and that is particularly important for communities that are trying to give voice and trying to say, this is what is happening to me, and nobody is listening. And it's the normative position of my research that environmental benefits and burdens should not be distributed on the basis of race, and that we should enforce Title VI, just like in the education or in the employment context it can be done. So my research asks, why does EPA have such a poor record? If we, if, we, if we acknowledge that it does, why is it? EPA itself has said in conversations with me over years, um, we're just different. We're, we're exceptional. We're different. Why are we different? Well, we delegate authority to the state. So to the extent that it's the state. Now, I should have said that Title VI, uh, the reach of Title VI is to public and private recipients of federal funds. It's not limited to the states or local governments, but in the area of the environment, a lot of the concerns are raised by um, states and local governments. So they say, how can we approve a delegated program and approve these um, permitting programs and then turn around and say, ah, they're discriminatory. So we have this, this problem of our relationship to the states. And um, the truth is that's an issue. It's a complication. We have to acknowledge that. But it's not, they're not alone. If you think about Medicaid plans and the way Medicaid works, Medicaid is a state uh, federal partnership. If you think about the Department of, An of Transportation, which has a more robust civil rights program, the Department of Transportation has a, uh, a federal uh, partnership. So then they say, well, we're also different because we're just complex. These issues are so complex. And um, we're very scientific. And the other agencies, well, not so scientific. But I'll tell you, if you look at decisions by the Department of uh, Transportation, and for those who are interested, you can find the Beaver Creek decision from the Department of Transportation as an example. This is in an Ohio city where Beaver Creek, the suburb, didn't want to put bus stops near its mall. And people uh, filed a complaint with the Department of Transportation. They took less than two years to investigate. They said, we're going to hold up your money unless you agree to the bus stop or unless you stop discriminating. And when they did their disparate impact analysis, they said, hey, the ridership of the buses, the people who would get out to the mall, are disproportionately people of color compared to the town of Beaver Creek. And hey, they spent about one sentence looking at whether it was having an impact. They assumed if you don't get to the mall, that could affect people in a negative way. They did not tie themselves up in pretzels with all kinds of scientific analyses of if you had to walk down the highway a mile from the last bus stop, how many, what is the risk of being killed or maimed, and how do we quantify that? That's what EPA does. It gets itself all tied up in pretzels saying it's scientific. Um, I could go through each one of these, and that is, in fact, what the research does. It takes a look at each of these potential explanatory factors for why EPA is distinct. And they all have some merit. In fact, EPA has, uh, well, EPA's uh, average grant, for example, which is another factor, is not actually so different than the average grant of education. But that's a possible explanatory factor. You could say maybe EPA has less leverage because the average grant is lower. 
Turns out that that doesn't check out. You could say EPA is exceptional because of its structural problem. Turns out that doesn't, again, they're factors, but it doesn't entirely check out. You could say the structure of the way in which it was set up, uh, the civil rights was set up at EPA. It was in the office of secretary, the secretary. Maybe it should be in a different kind of office. Turns out they're not exceptional on that either. You could say EPA, they put the external civil rights compliance office with their internal civil rights program. Maybe if it were separate, it would be more effective. Turns out a lot of other agencies do that too. Turns out none of these explanations is wholly explanatory. They're all perhaps factors. They're all difficulties to overcome. And what I think is, is um, the, the, the real answer here is that from the beginning of this agency, there's been a lack of political will. What do I mean by that? HEW, Health, Education, and Welfare, which was the, uh, the precursor to HHS and education, they were around in 1964. EPA was founded after the height of the desegregation of the South, after the experience of using Title VI in an effective way. And when Ruckelshaus, the first administrator of EPA, came in, he was trying to establish the credibility of EPA. And when he was asked by the Commission on Civil Rights from the get-go, from 1971, how are you using your leverage to ensure civil rights compliance? He said, essentially, look, I got to get people to accept EPA money to create a sewage system. I can't be bothered too much with civil rights enforcement. And from the beginning, that has been the dominant mode. And if you compare that, there's a great book called Healthcare Divided by David Smith. If you compare that with John Gardner's approach at HEW, where he said with the backing of Lyndon Johnson, we're gonna do this, we're gonna use Medicare certification, we're gonna desegregate those hospitals. That was an exercise of political will. So yes, there's federalism. Yes, there's a pushback from Congress. But there has never been at EPA a real exercise of political will to make this happen. So the last part I want to touch on and then save a few minutes for a Q&A or discussion is, OK, where do we go? Um, clearly, we have three years to figure out where to go. Um, we're not getting anywhere in the next three years. But that's, that's a luxury, right? Um, <laughs> We are still going to represent our clients. We're going to use all tools. Look, this administration is no different. This has been a total failure across administrations. And so our clients and we are using all the tools at our disposal that we have been using for the last few decades. But it does give us the opportunity to really think, OK, how do we do things differently? And I just do want to acknowledge for those people who may have worked at EPA over the last eight years that there has been effort, uh, both by Lisa Jackson and Gina McCarthy, to try to incrementally uh, make some changes. And, and, and that's a whole topic we could talk about. Um, there are some that were a little bit helpful. They moved uh, the Office of Civil Rights outside of the Office of the Secretary. I don't think that's going to make that much of a difference. They separated the uh, external from the internal Civil Rights Compliance Office. There were things that they did. Um, here's the best one. The first thing they, they touted that they were going to do is there's a form for new recipients of federal funds to fill out. And every agency has this kind of form. Until, I think, 2013, 2014, there was an asterisk on this form that was next to all the civil rights compliance questions. Do you comply with Title VI? Asterisk, you don't have to answer that. And in 2013, 2014, they got the form through the Office of Management and Budget without the asterisk. And literally, we went to a meeting with the administrator, and the administrator said, we're making real changes. We got rid of the asterisk. So when I say they were too little, too late, and they ran out of time, I really mean it. Good things to do, but not enough. So I think there's still a, a, a big space for incremental change. And one of the things the clinic is working on, for example, is developing a guidance document, programmatic guidance, with very specific language about, and I'm looking at Natalie, cumulative impacts and, and, um, and how you actually do a disparate impact analysis. So we will be ready to go. In the meantime, we can use it at the state level and other levels, but we will be ready to go to uh, have clear guidance documents. There's a long story about the interaction between uh, civil rights standards and EPA's you know, vision that it's hard for them to show a harm. Let's say a smokestack is blowing mercury into the air, but it's not violating its permits. EPA has said, oh, it's really hard for us to find harm because our environmental health thresholds are set to protect people from harm. So even if there's no safe level of lead or blowing mercury into the air, 
causes a harm, and we know that, they'll say there's no harm. We can't make a finding of disparate impact because they have coupled the civil rights standards with environmental standards in these cases. Create incentives to comply. Gee, it would be nice if they even threatened to withhold federal funds once um, and exercise this affirmative authority. Long term, though, uh, beyond this, this, um, these incremental reforms, uh, one, we have to overturn Sandoval. Since Sandoval, this is the Supreme Court case that said you can only go to court if you can show intentional discrimination, there have been um, legislative proposals over and over and over to uh, overturn it and to get the private right of action so we're not reliant on that federal agency to enforce the law. And uh, Senator Booker introduced the uh, Civil Rights Act of 19, uh, 2017. It's a placeholder to really build some momentum for the future. Uh, Congressman Bobby Scott has his own version. Congressman Ruiz introduced the Booker bill in the House, or the Booker Ruiz bill in the House. So that there's some momentum long term for that. The new part here that I want to suggest is that we really need to think 50 years later about this idea of having you know these this decentralized civil rights enforcement in each agency and to consider whether it should be placed in a centralized way, either at the Department of Justice or at a, 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 some kind of new agency akin to the EEOC, which would have the expertise and the momentum to actually enforce the law, and it wouldn't have this intra-agency tension between the goal of EPA as it perceives itself to get everyone to have clean water, for example, and addressing disparities. And that, again, could be a whole discussion which I'd be happy to have with any of you um, going forward. So um, I think I've saved 10 minutes for any discussion and Q&A, and maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> any questions or concerns? Yeah. at Earth Justice also. Um, so I just wanted you to comment on um, a context, um, and that is that it seems to many of us that the part of the problem has been a long-term split between environmental issues and human issues. And um, so I in that mix, we've, we've had a series of books on environmental justice and some workshops and so on too, but starting with, as you said, eight, 1987 and the UCC, um, statement on toxicity, it seems as though the moral force um, that could be brought to bear here, maybe more significantly, um, is the religious ethical component, which has had a long-term concern for justice. So <clears throat> I just wanted to bring that the history of this back into the equation and say some churches and so on are working on this, but how can they be more helpful? So let me take the first component of this split between the environmental and concern about places and spaces and humans and say that one of the theories that I've been trying to interrogate is that um, EPA was populated, first of all, as a whiter organization and has fewer people that had the perspective of um, lower income communities of color, for example, and I don't mean to push those two things together, they're not, they're not identical, but, um, and was a more scientific uh, organization, and that it was more environmental organization, that, you know, even Ruckel's house came from Indiana where he did great environmental work, but did not have the, the same passion, um, or at least exhibit the same passion toward issues affecting uh, humans and particularly addressing disparities. Um, so that's a theory. Edward Lau Rhodes uh, includes that in a book he wrote about environmental justice. Um, when you look at it, there is a difference racially in the racial makeup of EPA versus the other agencies, particularly at the leadership level. And that's part of the reason I'm, I'm saying it's part of this kind of toxic brew, so to speak, um, or the, the culture and the political will, not you know, solely an explanatory factor. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think that is part of the mix. And the, the um, failure at EPA and the culture at EPA is reflective of the larger failures that you're alluding to in the environmental movement historically. Over the last 10 years, in part because of the context of the Obama administration, I've been at meetings where I went to the Obama administration as an earth justice lawyer, and they said, where are your EJ partners? Right? They were putting pressure on the environmental movement and also 
the, the change in population. That, and, and also, frankly, the uh, points of view of different populations, that at Earth Justice, th we knew, they know, that um, the, the polling suggests that communities of color believe in climate change more than white communities on average and um, believe it's human caused and that something should be done about it. And so that polling suggests that's a, a natural constituency. So there is change in the environmental movement and every environmental group is, has gone through a diversity and inclusion plan and is trying to move into the 21st century in terms of understanding its own need to be more diverse. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done. A lot of the groups on the ground are already connected to um, churches, to moral movements, to civil rights movements. And um, at the clinic, we're part of a, a, a number of coalitions, but we have an alliance of groups that works on civil rights enforcement in the environmental justice space. And it includes civil rights groups, it includes Jesus people, it, you know, that's the name of the group. Um, it includes you know, a whole range of, of groups, many of which take their foundation to be the church. And, and it's a really important part of um, building a movement, particularly at the local level. At Tallahassee, Ron Smith is a minister. Um, we meet at the AME Church. Unfortunately, the AME Church is right next to the landfill. And um, it's hard to hear because they had to get air conditioning and filters because it smells so much in there and they're worried about people's health because all that vapor, they have vapor intrusion. So, um, so the pastor there is very helpful. Uh, Mary Evelyn's ideas um, of uh, uh, leveraging with, with uh, um, religion and morals and ethics is fantastic. Um, I was wondering if you have also explored the intersection of um, human rights uh, and civil rights in this context, because that could be another, another leverage, and it's, uh, it's international and it creates uh, some um, uh, media uh, impact. Yeah, great question. What about the use of international tools and what about the kind of connection to international issues? There are so many dimensions to that and the answer is yes, yes, and yes in different ways. Um, some advocates, I'm thinking of a group that just had to close shop but in New Orleans really just got disgusted with civil rights enforcement. They brought a whole range of cases in, in the cancer, cancer Alley in Louisiana, and EPA sat on it and did nothing. And they were so frustrated that they turned, and they actually created an organization um, that they named like international, or not international, but environmental human rights advocates. And they wound up going to the Inter-American Commission and uh, raising claims uh, about Mossville in Louisiana, and that has continued. Of course, if we think EPA's action doesn't have sufficient teeth. There's a frustration that though you can use this as you can your work with EPA to raise the visibility issue, the international courts don't have teeth either that has an immediate impact. So we have to understand the context and just as in our practice on civil rights, we have to think about how does this raise the visibility of an issue? What's the Uber strategy? How does it lead to transformation? That's what they were doing as well. So there's kind of a parallel there. It's not an either or. Um, I have worked on reports under CERD and ICCPR saying because of Sandoval, there's, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, international conventions, because of Sandoval, we have no effective recourse here in the United States. And therefore, you, you know, the, the um, international bodies should hold the United States accountable for violations of, of these covenants. Um, I think all of these, it's not either or, all of these are effective strategies as we think about our bandwidth in the clinic um, and whether we can scale at all, I think those are interesting areas for advocacy um, and I'd, I'd like to explore it more. Thank you, great question. One, two. I had to make sure I wasn't bypassing a student question. I'll let them ask first. Um, so my question relates to what kind of opposition you may get from the other side. So in, in the 
in the, in the case that you focused on as your example, this would be the landfill. So your, your lawsuit is against EPA, but you also have an indus industry as an interested party. Um, and I'm wondering in your experience at the Environmental Justice Law Clinic, what type of opposition you've gotten at your, at your meetings or within the lawsuit, because they're the people that are trying to get the permits to go through. So I would say there are three parties. There's EPA, which should be doing civil rights enforcement. There's the permitting authority, the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, and then there's the landfill. So how do you, what kind of strategies apply to each of them? And there also is, you know, depending on the state, there's the county commission. And that permitting usually starts at the county level and then goes to the state. And in fact, if a, in this case, Alabama's defense is, we don't actually consider where things go. It's the county that does that. So if you have a problem, go to the county. That's sort of their, their first party line. Um, the civil rights piece, and, and it, it, the civil rights angle is um, for EPA to enforce Title VI against a recipient of federal funds. So there are times that the landfill might be a recipient of federal funds. Let's say it got energy money or it got EPA money to do some, you know, some greening of the landfill. Um, in this case, they didn't. And so the recipient of federal funds that you can hold accountable for actions that are, un, you know, unjustly discriminatory would be the recipient would be ADEM, would be Alabama Department of Environmental Management. Now, at the same time, there can be lots of other strategies that are used around Stone's Throw landfill. And so these aren't mutually exclusive. Um, I haven't really gotten push, but that, so in, in this case, there's litigation against EPA only because they unreasonably delayed. Normally, it's EPA that's investigating the discrimination claim. And in fact, we're representing Tallahassee on two cases. One is the litigation against EPA, and the other is complaints of discrimination against Alabama's Department of Environmental Management. And then there's other forms of advocacy that are going on around the landfill itself. It's a really good question. We have had, there's no, there's no uh, process for intervention in a civil rights complaint filed with an agency, but in North Carolina, the pork industry attempted to intervene. And we wrote a brief saying there is no process for intervention. This is more like filing a complaint with the DA's office, and the DA, you know, we file the complaint with Office of Civil Rights, and they investigate. You can't intervene in that investigation. Um, so yes, sometimes they do get nervous, and sometimes they attempt to intervene. In another case we have in Alabama, and then I want to take two more questions. It's a really rich question that we could you know, spend some time on. Um, in another case we have in Alabama, Gr Green Group Holding, which it has the largest landfill in Alabama. It's in Uniontown, Alabama. Um, they sued our clients for defamation. So it's not that they never get nervous, um, and it's not that they sit on the sidelines. You can bet that they're paying attention. Um, I think the only reason they don't do more is that EPA has been so ineffective and so they don't think it has teeth. But really great question. I think there was here and here. Greetings. I love how you covered my home state, Alabama, so thank you for that. <laughs> my question is, um, uh, I know that there were many cases, I think, over time as EJ has gotten more and more visible where the burden of proof is on the victim. The burden of proof is on the victim. How does, you know, how can I prove that this uh, landfill, how can I prove that this company is targeting me? And my question is, and I, and I appreciate all of the work that you all are doing, but what would you say to communities of people that don't have access to um, an environmental justice clinic that may be losing, at the, the, as the hollow hope as you put it, but may be losing hope because they're still living in it and they've been dealing with it for more than 30 years? Really great question. And there's, there's something in common in these two questions I want to say. As someone who came of age as a civil rights lawyer, I believe there's a role for government. I really do, local, state, and federal government. And so part of why it's appropriate to put the pressure on EPA is government should be protecting people's rights. That is the foundation of civil rights, right? So um, uh, that's one piece of it. Um, we are working, actually there's a science team, our science team had to leave, um, but a couple of the FES and School of Public Health students are working on what we call science. I mean, that sounds crazy since it's such a big, but the idea is to, uh, 
work with others who are like-minded to really think about how we add to the scientific capacity available to our partners and community groups. There are all kinds of complexities to that. How do people know about it? Who's chosen? How do you, you know, the, the in, just like the interaction between government and EJ groups is complicated and the interaction between lawyers and EJ groups, the interaction between scientists and EJ groups has a lot of complexity to it. So how do you facilitate that? So great question, very full, you know, that's only the tip of the iceberg on, on the question, but you, you pointed out something really important. Can, do we have time to take two more questions? I think there was one, two. Did you, did you have your hand? Okay, so, yeah. Thank you, this has been a really interesting presentation. Um, so my question um, is, okay, you've explained what the situation is in Alabama. My understanding is that in other uh, localities and states, say for the state of Virginia, that um, the, some of the incentive to set aside that land for landfills in very poor communities has been economic. And um, they get you know, some sort of economic incentive for agreeing to open the landfill and, and bring it into an area because um, they don't, the community doesn't have other forms of enterprise that bring in tax revenues. And so this is how you pay for schools and other services. Can you comment on that uh, piece of it a little bit? No doubt that there are uh, you know, significant economic issues throughout all of, all of this. Um, they don't all run in one direction. I'll tell you, in, in Uniontown, um, maybe at some point, if folks are interested, we could have a conversation. I mean, Uniontown is just a great case study. I was going through the town with our client the first time I went there, and uh, you know, there's almost nothing open. There's, there's one restaurant that closes at three, it's 2,000 people at three o'clock, otherwise if you want to eat, you go to the gas station. And um, there's a Piggly Wiggly that's half empty. Um, it, it, it's extraordinary, and, and everything's boarded up. It was a beautiful town, very segregated. It really, it's decline came with desegregation. Decline for white people came with desegregation. Um, but uh, I asked her, when did this town become so economically depressed? And really, without skipping a beat, and she wasn't kidding, she said, when the feds came in. I said, what do you mean when the feds came in? She said, well, they busted the big meth ring. So her idea of economically doing okay was when they had a meth trade. I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing how economically depressed Uniontown is. So no question. Does that mean people want a polluting source in their community? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. And, and do they get the information to make those decisions? Not necessarily. So I, I think, in a way, um, you know, the economic issues are really present and how do we do green jobs, economic revitalization, and not have these two things in opposition. Because I think what you find in a place like Uniontown is the more polluted it is, the more property values go down and the less people want to live there. So um, I don't, you know, it's a more complex issue um, for sure, but, uh, but it's not one thing versus another. And that's what I found in, in really all these towns that I work in, that there's a real concern about health, there's a real concern about property values, there's a real concern about way of life. And, um, and many of these polluting issues don't have a lot of local jobs anyway. And the tax base is not really improved. In, in Uniontown, another problem is uh, the polluting facilities take a lot of the water and their sewage is over, literally overflowing into a creek that's going into a river. And, so, and there's been no additional infrastructure and so people have worse water because of the bit of economic development that supposedly is there. So really good question, rich, rich question to kind of tease out uh, what's really going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Oh, totally my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me.